refresh. And if you want to follow along with the slides, it is at my GitHub account. My name is Estelle, and that's all you have to remember. Uh, my GitHub account is estelle.github.com. If you, or rather IO, if you add a snow to that, you can follow along with the slides. Um, what I am showing you might be fun to do, but please don't try this at home, because if you ever actually make a website like this, it'll be so annoying. Um, and actually, the snowflakes will stop momentarily because they are annoying. So what we're going to talk about today is everything that you see on this slide. It's all done in CSS. In fact, there are only two images in this entire deck, the uh, cover of my books, and I'm going to show you how to animate a sprite. So the sprite is actually an image. But everything else is pure CSS. So a little bit about me. I'm a blog at standardista.com, and if you can follow me on Twitter at EstelleBW, that's the main reason I speak is because I am a Twitter reporter. Um, so please follow me. Otherwise, if you're interested in any of these books, they are all out except for HTML5, the definitive guide, which I'm busy writing. Okay, so the code for those snowflakes that you saw was simply a bunch of I elements. And I picked I because semantically it has no meaning. And then I have a div with class snowman, and that is it for the snowman. There aren't different divs inside of there. So everything, that is the code that you need to know, the HTML markup that you need to know for this deck. Everything else is CSS. So let me uh, refresh the snowflakes a little bit here. What you see on this deck right here is done with selectors, linear gradients, opacity, order radius, transforms, transitions, and animations. When you see the snowman, we are also having radial gradients, uh, background size we're using, generated content, pseudo elements, um, which is generated content, and also RGBA colors. So how did I do, um, when I say selectors, what's the point of the selectors? Well, we have a bunch of I elements, and every single one of them is a snowflake. But if you look at it, they're all coming down at different times. They're different sizes. They're different opacity. They're basically random. So I had to individually select all the snowflakes, but when you saw the code, I didn't add a single class. Because with CSS and CSS selectors, you don't need to add classes to your code. So the way I did it is basically I did end of type. I'm only going to cover uh, selectors briefly today, but if you want more information on um, on selectors. I have a full hour or two hour workshop because it always goes over on purely on, on, on CSS selectors. You can just hit the workshop link down there. Um, I have a browser support chart. All of these selectors are IE9 plus and all the other browsers supported for a very long time. And um, you can just look at the specification if you're interested. So structural selectors. You can basically pick an element based on the order that it is in the code. So let's say you have, um, I'm sure you've all done a stripey table. You can actually do nth of type even and make it gray, and nth of type odd and make it white. Or you can do nth of type 3n and make those gray, nth of type uh, 3n plus 1, so every other one that comes after the third. So let's go a little bit more into that. Here's an example of the structural selectors. On the right, I have a list. And all it is is 1 through 10. And on the left, you'll see that there are selectors. There is first child and last child. It's exactly what it sounds. The first child of the UL is number 1. The last child of the UL is number 10. And if you can see, number 1 is bold. And for some reason, number 10 isn't. Probably because I didn't uh, code it correctly in the background. Um, and then I did li nth of type even. Even and odd are two keywords that you can use uh, in this equation, in the selectors equation. And even is number 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. It would be the same as 2n. And if you see number 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, and then if we had 12, 14, they would all have a background that is gray. Um, then I said nth child 3. That means the third child of its parent, that if it is an li, because I did preface it with li, so your uh, browser would find the third child, check to see if it's an LI. In this case, a UL can only have LIs. Um, and the third one, you see the text is gray. Then we have LI first of type and last of type. I go into this in huge depth in my selectors talk. But basically, the difference between first of type and last of type is first child and last child 
just look at the first and last child or nth child. Just look at the children, count the children in order, and then check to see if it's a match. LI first of type doesn't look at the first child. It looks at the first LI. Um, and then if we had nth of type, it would look at the first, second, third, only of the LIs. So first of type and last of type, in this case, have a line through them. And here we see number one and number 10 do have a line through them. Li nth of type odd, they're all, uh, the odd ones are all white. Um, nth of type 4n, which would be 4n, it would be 4 times 0, 0, so that doesn't count, 4 times 1, which is 4, 8, 12, 16, uh, basic algebra. Um, if you notice that 4 um, and number 8, and if there was a 12 and there was a 16, they would all be pink. And then nth of type 3n minus 1. So what we do is we um, replace the n with the 1, and 3 minus 1 is 2. We replace the n with the 2, which was that equation, 3 times 2 minus 1 is 5. So it would be 3, I mean, sorry, 2, 5, 8, 11. Um, if you notice that 2, 5, and 8 are all right aligned. If you actually want to play with this, you don't have time in this talk, but uh, there's a, a little slide where you can um, do it yourself and test it out. Okay. Uh, next, we have the randomness. And um, so this is, I use basically the structural selectors that we just covered to make these things random. Uh, this is not the exact code I used, but you'll see it says nth of type 5n, 5n plus 1, 5n plus 2. And it's basically every fifth um, snowflake was a different size. And then I did 3n, 3n plus 1, 3n plus 2. Every third snowflake started at a different time. And we're going to cover animation delay later on. And then every seventh um, and, uh, snowflake had a different opacity. And every eleventh um, snowflake had a different timing function. And we haven't covered the uh, timing functions yet, but we will later on. So basically, I created this, this randomness. And if you look, these are um, a replica of the snowflakes that I use for the page. And if you just look at the large ones, uh, this first large one, I'm not sure if you guys can see what I'm highlighting, but imagine that you can. So there's basically four different sizes. So you'll see that they change sizes every fourth one. But the large one and the large one next uh, four over have a different opacity. And they're all going to actually fall at a different rate and a different start time. Uh, I'm not going to refresh this page because I don't want the snowflakes to come down because they annoy, they pretty annoy me. Um, so those are the selectors that I used in this talk. But that's not all we are provided with CSS3 selectors. And remember that all of these CSS3 selectors work in IE9. But if you use jQuery um, or any other library, you can use Selectivisor to make most of these um, be supported as well. Um, other selectors include, but I'm not going to cover them in detail, attribute selectors. And the first four on this page are actually supported in IE8. Uh, the last three to start with, ends with, and find anywhere are, um, are later on. Um, and here are even more that we can use. And we actually covered some other people in other talks covered it earlier today. So what else did I do with these selectors? I created the, um, the snowman's nose. The snowman's nose is generated content. And let's actually, two slides over is how I did it. So here, I basically snowman after. So that's a pseudo element, which is a selector. I said the content is empty. Whenever you use a pseudo element, you have to include content. And then I basically, uh, here's an example where I made the borders magenta, teal, blue, and purple. But if I get rid of this line, you'll see that it's orange, just like the, the nose. And right here, I border with the 50. But if I cut that out, um, you can barely see it. But that is the nose for our little snowman. So what I did here is I created this empty element on the page, purely decorative. Now, you really should use generated content only for decorative reasons. But if you want to cheat, you can actually use it for non-decorative reasons. Um, in this example, I've used selectors and counting. So I have used, this is not um, in the deck, there's no snowman made out of this or anything, but I have used, I've looked for anything that is invalid, and I'm counting them. I'm using counter increments. And then, right now, I have zero invalid entries. But if I put an invalid entry in, notice that it went up to one. And if I put another invalid entry, and if I put another invalid entry, and if I write hello, 
Those are all invalid. I now have four invalid entries. So selectors not only let you um, work when you load the page, but they're, they're all dynamic. They're always active. It's a live um, action. So when I actually make one of these correct, notice that it changed down to three. So when you do your um, NSF type odd for your stripes tables, if you remove nine cells or ten cells, you don't have to add a class of odd and even. It actually updates it for you. And you can even do something. You really shouldn't do this because here I'm giving important information and generated content, and generated content is not fully accessible. But you can actually do this kind of crazy stuff with, um, with selectors. Okay, enough with selectors. Let's go on to gradients. The background of this um, slide deck is a simple gradient. It goes from blue to white. And gradients are actually really easy to write. You write background image, you write that you want a linear gradient, and you write the color you want to go from and the color you want to go to. So this is a darker blue and this is a lighter blue. Um, you can also, this is the default way of writing it. It always goes to the bottom. Um, the new version, the unprefixed version, says to bottom, which is the default, so you can just omit it, but it is to bottom. And the default color stops are 0 and 100%. Um, so I could have also written 180 degrees. The difference between the prefix version and the non-prefix version is the directionality. So in the prefix version, I would have written top because it's going from the top to the bottom. But in the non-prefix version, you write to, the to keyword, and the direction it's going to. And also the angles are different. Generally, it doesn't really matter. So how did I make my snowflakes? I simply used a linear gradient, um, a background image with actually four linear gradients. So I have one going from top right to bottom left, one from going top left to bottom right, one going vertically, and one going horizontally. And how did I make these hard lines right here? I used color stops that were in the exact same location. So this first gradient, the angle is 180 degrees, and it's transparent, 255, 255, 255, 0, from the 0% mark to the 40% mark. And then there's a hard line, there's a hard change from transparent to white at the 40% mark. And then it goes over to the 60% mark, all white, and then there's a hard change at the 60% mark uh, back to transparent. So why did I not use the keyword transparent? Because tra transparent is actually transparent black. It's 0, 0, 0, 0. So when you use the keyword transparent, you're using RGBA 0, 0, 0, 0, not 255, 255, 255, 0. In this case, it wouldn't really matter because it's a hard stop, but you might find yourself having ugly effects. So I'll, um, it's, I recommend always using um, the color. Truthfully, browsers can handle the whites to blacks and blacks, but not other colors when you're doing transparent. Okay. Gradients. So this is just a little toy. You can play with it, and you can change the, um, the uh, angles. Actually, let me do this, and I'm not going to cover this here. Um, but those are linear gradients. I have a full talk on uh, linear gradients, and when I say full talk, just go to my GitHub page, estelle.github.io, and there's a slide deck there, and um, it's all open source. Feel free to fork it and, um, and send me a pull request for all my mistakes. Um, and then we also have, in addition to linear, we have radial. So we can do circle or ellipse. Ellipse is actually the default. Um, and you basically tell it where you want to start. Um, and that's the old syntax, so I'm not going to cover that. Okay, so um, in terms of uh, gradients, what can you do with gradients? You can do simple things like the top to bottom that I did here, or the snowflake, or you can just go um, a little bit crazy and make really hideous backgrounds for your web pages. So once again, there are no images in this deck other than the book covers and the sprite that will come to later. So these um, things, I don't know what to call them, these patterns, um, I was going to use an insult to, uh, but I will say how beautiful they are instead. They're not. But um, these are all patterns uh, done just using uh, linear and radial gradients. Um, here are some resources for uh, gradients. Uh, just important things to note. Here's my the link to my gradient workshop. Leia Veru has a bunch of uh, really beautiful gradients. I have a bunch of really ugly ones, and I actually uh, created about 20 country flags just using gradients. 
So have fun with them. Just remember, if you want to do a nice effects, you can create effects with color stops that are in the same location. Okay. We also use opacity, and the reason everyone understands opacity, and I don't really need to cover it, I know you guys know everything about opacity, but there is one thing I want to go over, which is opacity zero. So um, opacity zero, the example is actually below the page, but it says opacity 0 0.25 right here. Um, the next one says opacity zero. It's completely invisible. So opacity actually makes the whole thing alpha transparent. What you might often want is you to use alpha transparency as a color. I don't know why there's a snowflake going down the page on this one, but that's okay. Um, so here, I didn't actually make the whole thing disappear. You can actually see this fuzz because there is a text shadow. Um, and that's actually a cool way to make um, effects is to give the text a color of RGBA 0, 0, 0, 0, uh, and then put... Um, text shadows and you can make really, really cool um, text effects. So that's why I want to point out opacity and alpha transparency and kind of their difference. Okay. Um, also in CSS3 we've got HSLA and for designers it's this is more like Photoshop where they have hue, saturation, and brightness and alpha transparency. I don't know Photoshop. Um, I never learned to make coffee and I never learned to do Photoshop because I didn't ever want to have a job where I had to do either of those things. Uh, but this makes sense to a lot of people, uh, just not fully to me. So it goes from red through the spectrum and all the way to red again. Saturation is, is it a lot of color or no color? Here we have no color. Here we are fully saturated. Lightness is how much white or black? This is uh, zero is black, 100% is white. Generally what you want is 50% or close to it. Um, and alpha transparency is, uh, the, you know, the transparency. If you want, um, on my GitHub page, there's also a color picker, so you can pick a color that you like, and it'll actually convert it to RGBA and, um, and hexadecimal version of alpha transparency for you. Okay. Yeah, I'll give you the tip. Uh, one other tip that I had for alpha transparency is when you make shadows, I never make shadows using gray colors. Instead, I always use a RGBA with a very... Um, transparent version of black, it, ma it makes it very, a much more natural drop shadow. So when you're doing text shadows and when you're doing box shadows, use RGBA or AHSLA instead of um, hexadecimal values and you get a much better effect. Okay. So then we have border radius, and I think you guys probably think you know everything about border radius. Uh, simply uh, border radius 50% to make the snowflakes. There are a few quirks to border radius though. One thing a lot of people don't know is the slash. So if you put a slash in between um, the shorthand value, not in the longhand value, like if you do border top left, uh, border radius, uh, border, I forget the longhand. Oh, well, I'll uh, remember it later. Um, what was I going to say? In the shorthand, if you put a slash, one is the vertical um, axis and one is the horizontal axis. So then you will get this kind of weird shape here. If you don't have the slash, notice this says 10 pixels, 30 pixels, both are the exact same value or so it seems. One has a slash, one doesn't. Another thing is you don't need to prefix these. The only time that you need a prefix is for Android 2.3 at this point and you don't want to serve a border radius to Android 2.3 because um, it's such a crappy browser that it doesn't handle it correctly. So leave off all the, the, the prefixes, please. Stop using prefixes. I'm, um, and MS, I see MS prefix, it was never even necessary. So don't use prefixes if you don't need to because all you're doing is targeting browsers that don't support it as well. Um, one other thing to note is when you use something like 50% or uh, rather 200 pixels and it's actually bigger, um, like your element is only 100 pixels, it actually brings it down proportionally. So if you say um, border radius 50 pixels, 100, oops, I went over one. Let me, my slides are off, so I'm just going to move this over and hopefully you guys can see that better. Um, or let me go full screen. Okay, um, it's still off-centered, which is really weird. Let me reload it. Okay, there we go. And we're gonna get the snowflakes again. Sorry about that. So um, if you say, if you give like border radius 100 pixels, 200 pixels, and your box is only 50 pixels by 50 pixels, you're actually going to have um, 
it's going to be uh, shrinking down proportionally. So in two corners, you'll have um, uh, fifty percent on two sides, and on the other sides, you're going to have hundred percent. Okay. So transforms. That is the next thing I want to talk about. So transforms is actually when you take an element and either translate it, rotate it, scale it, or skew it, or a combination of all four of them. So this box down here, the one, uh, the big box that's tilted, is actually the same box. It's just generated content, copying it and transforming it, and translating it. Translate means um, translate means it moves it along the x and the y axes. So here I'm moving it. Um, 80 pixels, negative 80 pixels, so 80 pixels to the left and 200 pixels down. And then I'm rotating it 15 degrees that way. And then I'm scaling it um, twice as wide and one half times as tall. And then I'm skewing it. So skewing it is kind of like taking it like this and just going like that. So the top and the bottom will be the same if you do it along the X. But the left and right will be um, skewed. Or if you do it along the Y, you will have it like this and these two will be parallel. Or you could skew it in the um, you just use skew into all four sides. If you want, um, I also have a tutorial on uh, transforms in my blog. So let's show these in action. Here is, um, this one is just being translated 200 pixels over. When I go off of it, it comes back. This one is rotating. Um, by default, elements rotate among this center point. This one I'm scaling it, and you're seeing it get bigger. And this last one is a different property altogether. It's called transform origin. There's going to be a pink dot that shows up. What I'm saying is, instead of making it rotate around its center point, make it rotate around a, a spot that is 20 pixels at the top and 20 pixels to the left. So when I do that, there goes the pink, pink circle, and it goes around. And when I come off, it goes back. Now, one thing to note is that it's really important. Your transform order is really important. So here I have three boxes. These are all, the boxes are actually identical boxes, one on top of the other. The purple box is the default spot for it. The uh, one with the greenish or teal border that is off to the right, um, you'll notice it's um, aligned at the same spot, but it's rotated. What I did is I put, first put the translate X of 200 pixels, so I moved it 200 pixels to the right, and then I rotated it 135 degrees. The second one, the pink one, what I did is I rotated it first. And you'll notice that it is rotated, that, that line that goes this way is right smack in the middle of it. So it depends what order it is that you put it in. The green one, I said translate 200 pixels, then rotate 135 degrees. The pink one, I said rotate first. So I did rotate 135 degrees, then translate. So if you rotate first, you're trans late direction will be on the rotated axis. So I'm rotating it along um, this axis here. I mean, I'm translating it along this axis here. Um, I was going to, yeah, so it's basically, if I did transform, translate, transform, rotate, transform, scale, if I put those three calls in, it would only transform because, uh, tra it would only scale because the transform scale would overwrite the transform rotate, which had overwritten as transform translate. So you use the shorthand as shown here, right? But you have to make sure that you have the right order. Okay, so a few things to note. You still need a vendor prefix for WebKit and for uh, Microsoft since IE9, but you don't need it in IE10, I don't think. Um, but I'm not sure. We can check can I use. Uh, take advantage of transform origin. When you saw my snowflakes coming down, the reason they come down randomly instead of as straight lines going up and down is because I'm, I'm changing the transform origin. Each one has a different transform origin. So they're floating around this point. So they're floating, instead of rotating around themselves like this, they're rotating like this, but they're also going down, so they're kind of going like that. And you can't see that, so I should have done that. Okay. Oops. Okay. Next, we have transitions, and I'm going to cover all these properties uh, when I do animation, so um, which is coming up uh, next or in a moment. So I'm not going to go in depth, but a transition enables you to um, change the state of, of an element over an amount of time. And if you think you've never done a transition, you have done a transition. Uh, I.e., two supported transitions, which was just a color blue 
a hover color equals red, it just transitioned over zero seconds. So in transitions, you say what property you want transition, but the most important feature of it is the duration, because instead of being over zero milliseconds, it's over the amount of time that you declared, either in seconds or milliseconds. Um, and then you can put a timing function, which I'll talk about during animation. You can do a delay, and I highly recommend doing a delay if you're going to do a, a hover effect, because you don't want someone accidentally um, like going across the screen and all these things happening. Um, and then there's a shorthand called transition, which is um, shorthand uh, for all the other properties. It's new in IE10, so transforms were in IE9 with a prefix, but transitions are in new in IE10 without a prefix. Okay, so here's an example of transition. When I hover over this, it's going to grow, and when I hover off of it, it's going to not. It's going to shrink. And what I do, I said change the color from black to pink, change the font size, um, increasing it by 20%, uh, change the background color, making it slightly more opaque. Um, so I said, uh, I'll point to my screen, but here it says transition all, so all the properties, over half a second, ease in, but wait 50 milliseconds before starting. So let's go off of that again. Um, I wrote it in shorthand using all, but I could have also just said only do specific properties. And if you're going to do specific properties, right here, color, font size, background color. You see how they're comma separated? Notice that transitions are comma separated and transforms are space separated. So that's a difference that you need to remember. Okay, so now we can get to animations now that we are halfway through. Okay, that's pretty good on timing. So, to, uh, to make animations, we need to first define a keyframe. And when we define a keyframe, that is actually an animation that we give a name to, and then we can use it on as many elements as we want. Um, and then we have to attach the animation to an element by giving it a name and a duration and a timing function and a duration count and a direction and a play state and a delay and a film mode, or you can just use the shorthand for all of that. So let's learn how to do keyframes. So with that snowflakes going from the top to the bottom, um, and here it's saying keyframe falling, and that, um, notice that the word falling, that is the name that I have given my animation, something that I created, and it is not quoted. Um, it's an ident, not a string, so it should not be quoted. And then I'm going to say from, um, and it's, it's, a, it's a property block, just like you would find with a selector, so I call it a time selector, and, and the from is a 0% time selector. Um, and then the two is a 100% time selector. So say top from top negative 40, move it down to 1,000 pixels from the top. I really should use translate y, negative 40, and then 1,000. The exact same thing written without the keywords, 0% and 100% instead of to and from. I wanted to point out to and from, but I've never used to and from in production. I always use zero and 100% because I think more people are used to it. Um, but don't forget the percentage. Um, and it says don't forget the 100%. You actually only need to include one value. You can just do 100% top 1,000. Or you can do 50%, but you have to include one. Um, and don't quote the animation yet. If you do 100%, um, it'll go from wherever it was supposed to be to 100% and then uh, back again. Okay, granular control. So before I just did 0 to 100%, and those were exactly like transitions. Um, I could have transitioned from top to bottom. I could have done that with a transition. I didn't need an animation. But with animation, I can do a bit more granular control. So in this example, one second, we'll Real coke, real sugar, real caffeine. Okay, from and that was not a that was not a paid commercial, but it did sound like a commercial. Um, so falling, I'm going from zero to ten percent. I mean, I'm just going from negative forty pixels to four hundred pixels in just ten percent of the time. So I'm going basically forty five percent of the way, or forty percent, yeah, forty four percent of the way, in um, let's say it's ten seconds. So in one second out of the ten seconds. And then I'm going really slow. I'm only going 16% um, of the way during the middle 80% of the time. So from second two to eight, it's in the middle there. And then I'm speeding up again at the end. 
that's granular control. By using um, different properties and different um, uh, timing selectors, you can really control like you could with Flash. And you don't have to just animate one property like we were doing before. In this example, I am dropping the snowflake, but I'm also changing the opacity. So when it's in the middle, the opacity is only 50%. So notice here I've top and I top again, right? I don't need a top middle because it's a smooth, it's going down smoothly. I'm not changing, I don't need an extra keyframe for that, like I did in the previous example. What was the previous example's name? Falling, I should give it a different name. Um, falling and dimming, I am also dimming it. And so I'm going from opaque to translucent to opaque. So there I do need a 50%, um, you know, a change of 50%. And I probably could have left out the opacity on the top um, at the 0% and 100%. Um, so you can change multiple properties. Um, you can have a property, like you don't need to include it each time. So you can include properties in every single time selector or time uh, code block, or just the first and last, or just the last. Um, one thing you can't do is replicate um, a timing selector. You can only have one zero percent and one fifty percent and one hundred percent, because although these are kind of like time selectors, they're also like properties, and they'll override each other. I need to come up with a real name for them. Okay, so. You can actually use duplicate free key keyframes. If you have keyframes that do the exact same thing, uh, this is a really bad example, but um, 0, 30, and 100%, you can do that. You can put commas if they're going to do the exact same thing. And here at 50 and 80%. Um, so from 50 to 80%, it's actually translated 40% over. And from 80% um, to 30%, it's on the left-hand side. And that's basically what that one says. Okay, and so prefixing. You don't need to put, the only prefix that you still need to include is white kit. You don't need to include MS, you never needed to. Um, Opera has uh, changed, only Opera 12 supported dash O, but now they're blank, so they support dash white kit. Um, and uh, Firefox is no longer prefixed, and I think, Chrome has removed the prefix, and I'm not 100% sure. I think it might be the next version. Um, uh, to can I use like 100 times a day? So, all you to to do prefixing, if you have properties that need to be prefixed, don't forget to prefix them. But you need to put a, the prefix in front of the keyframes, key and therefore you have to declare the exact same animation twice. Um, if you are doing, let's say, um, well, no, that won't work. I'm trying to think of one that still needs um, another prefix. Um, okay, like let's say if um, you still need a Mozilla. Oops, sorry, went flying forward. If you needed Moz, Moz specific. You could actually put it in here because it doesn't need the um, it doesn't need to have a prefix here, but it does maybe in this property name or in the property value. So just write your CSS as you would normally here with the prefixes when you need a prefix. But you don't need to separate it out and put a moz here because moz doesn't need it. Okay, hope that makes sense. So in reality, you don't want to be um, translating, or you don't want to be animating top, you really want to be animating transforms, because they're smoother, and if you actually put it into a, um, if you change the opacity, uh, if you put the opacity at all, or if you put it in a 3D context um, with a translate Z, or something like that, it actually goes onto the GPU, and it performs much better, and it's much smoother, but even if you don't, um, uh, basically, there's some properties that will repaint and reflow, and if you actually put them into their own um, uh, into their own context, you won't have to reflow the page. Like if you notice the font um, example when I transitioned, it was really janky, it was horrible. Um, that was because I changed the font size instead of using scale. So I highly recommend 
using the transforms that we just learned when you're doing animation. You'll get much, much nicer animations. Okay, so don't be perfect. Okay, so here's that snowflake that I was showing you. I used transform origin to make it so that the snowflake doesn't just fall from top to bottom. I actually rotated it around um, a spot that was left um, on its left side and 20 pixels uh, up. Okay, so where are we here? We are with transform origin. Okay, we learned transform origin. And I talked about hardware acceleration already. Now the thing is, we created these animations, but in truth we haven't actually animated anything. We've just created an animation that we can put attached to an element. So if, let's figure out how to actually attach it to the element. So in this example, we've had snowflakes. And this is, I, I made the uh, background dark. You could actually see the snowflake, but it's basically the snowflake. Um, and this was the code that I used for the snowflake. I said display line block. In this case, the height is 20 by 20 inches, not it's like 100 by 100, but that's okay. Background image is those four gradients, you know, this way. And then I have the WebKit transform and the transform origin over to the left and up. So that is the base for the snowflake. Still no animation. And then I say animation name following. And still, I've attached the animation. This is the animation that we created. The keyframes is called falling, and nothing is happening. That is because the animation just occurred in zero seconds, and you couldn't see it because um, it was too fast. Actually, it didn't happen because zero seconds um, is no amount of time. So what you need is an animation duration. So um, some of those snowflakes that you saw earlier were really fast and some of them were painfully slow. Um, but duration, basically, you're, you're going from 0 to 100%, you know, in that keyframes, over the amount of time that you determine. So you can use one animation for a um, call for hundreds of different things. You know, if you're just going from top to bottom, there's a lot of things that might go left to right, top to bottom, open to close. You just have to declare one animation, and you can use it on all sorts of different elements, just changing the animation properties on that element. So we have the animation duration. Then we have the animation timing function. So the animation timing function is basically um, have, oh, I missed including linear. Linear should be in there and it's not there. So, but it's down here. So linear means uh, just start at the same speed and end at the same speed. Ease in means uh, go slower and then faster. Ease out means faster than slower. Ease in out means slow, speed up, and slow back out. And then step start, step end, and steps is kind of cool. And Cubic Bezier allows you to do its own. So let's just do um, uh, an ease in. So it's slower, and then it got faster. And then I'm going to do a step. And here it says steps and five and start. So it's going to just jump five times as it goes down to the bottom. One, two, three, four, five. And that's step. So what is the point of step? Step is actually super powerful, and um, we have a dancing side to show you how powerful it is. So when I said there were two images in the deck, this is um, the other image. There was my book cover, and then there's a side dancing around the page. And the way I actually did side is, um, using a PNG. And the PNG is a sprite, and it has him in 23 different moves. And then I say, animation game style, over four seconds, steps. He's going to change spots 23 times as he moves across the page. I mean, um, actually, let's get rid of move around. I have to get rid of it here. Okay, so now he's just dancing in place because I got rid of move around. Um, so all it is is a sprite is jumping through 23 frames, going here's frame one, here's frame two, here's frame three, here's frame four. And because there's so many, I mean, it's, it is a little jerky because uh, this is an illustrator. And um, I had to pay someone to do this because I don't know how to use Illustrator because I didn't want a job using Illustrator. Um, but she created a sprite for me of him in different motions and his hands are changing a little bit in speed and his jacket's going up. And so all it's doing is taking a background image 
and moving it from one picture of the sprite to the next picture of the sprite to the next picture of the sprite. If I had used linear, you're going to get sick if I do this. I think it works. Mm, just get rid of this. And of course, I broke everything. Oh well. Um, okay, let's try it out here. Let's try this out here. Okay, failed attempt. I'm going to give up and move on. So basically, believe me, that's a sprite with 23 images. Okay, so the next thing that we have in animation, so that was um, animation timing function using step function. So if you ever want to actually do uh, live looking things or, or use a sprite to animate, kind of like one of those booklets where it had a slightly different drawing on every page. Um, feel free to use a step, really powerful. Then we have animation iteration count. By default, um, the default is one. Everything you've seen so far animates once, except for I've said infinite on some of them. And in this case, it's going to go three times, and then all the snow is going to start falling again, because that frame did not work. And it goes three times. Okay. So that's iteration count with three. Generally, um, you can leave it off if you just wanted to do it once, or you're going to use infinite. Those are the two most common. The snowflakes that are coming down, some of them say eight, some of them say 12. Basically, I wanted all of them to stop at two minutes. So um, I actually use count to do that, and I use math, uh, basic algebra, to figure out how many it could go need to cycle through for it to stop after a minute or two. OK, animation delay is how long before you start the animation. So if you notice there, it just went down twice. If I go here a little bit positive, it'll wait a second, and then it'll go down three times. And now I'm going to try to make it go down just once. There. How did I do that? So the animation duration is three seconds. The animation count, oh, this should be three. Some of these are editable and some of these aren't. Three, okay? So the duration is three seconds and the count is three. So that's a total of nine seconds. So when I said delay negative 6.5 seconds, it actually only did the last 2.5 seconds of the third animation. So this may sound useless, but it's actually super powerful. Like, let's say you want to do a seesaw, and you want to start them like this and go like this, but you don't want the guy to wait up here while this one goes up and then down and then start, right? So you can start one of the seesaws at a negative point in time, and then it will just start on the second part of the animation. So you can actually use negative animation delay, not just positive animation delay. Um, to, to, to switch things up and make things different. Okay, animation direction. By default, value is normal, which means it goes from 0 to 100% and jumps back to 0, 0 and goes back to 100% and jumps back to 0 and jumps and then slowly goes back to 100%. If you use instead the keyword alternate, um, if you instead use the keyword alternate, it goes from 0 to 100% over the amount of time, and then from 100% to 0 over the same amount of time. So here the duration is 3 seconds. So from 0 to 3 seconds, it would be going from 0% to 100%. And from 3 seconds to 6 seconds, it would be going from 100% back up to 0%. So that's animation direction. You can basically, snowflakes only should be going normal from top to bottom. Um, but if you have something going like this, left to right across the page, you want to use uh, animation direction of alternate. Okay. 
Um, and thankfully, we have the animation shorthand, because what I've been writing out so far is this whole thing, which is a bit crazy. But all you have to do is um, declare it twice, uh, once with a WebP prefix, once without, and say the animation name, the duration, the timing function, the delay, and uh, the count, and then the direction. And truthfully with this, um, you only have to put, the only two required values are the first two. You need a name and you need a duration. Everything else is optional. But if you don't have a name, then, you don't have, then there's no animation attached to it. And if you don't have a time that, that it takes a duration, then it's zero and you won't actually see an effect. So what happens at animation end? When you saw the snowflakes, like if you actually inspect the page, the snowflakes are actually all way up the top. Um, there's 70 pixels off the page. And if you saw in slide number like seven or something when I had all the snowflakes, they were all just hanging out at the top when they were done animating. When animation ends, it's as if the animation was never put on the element in the first place. And from the time that the page loads until the delay expires, it's as if the animation was never even put onto the element. But you can override that. And that is what animation fill mode does. So animation fill mode has four potential values. None forwards, backwards, and both. None is the default state. It means don't do any, pretend the animation's not there until the delay is expired, and then at the delay, go to the 0%, then make it go to the 100%, and when you jump the animation, go back to the default values of the page. So you can make something like here, the, the, the um, snowflake is blue, and it's at the bottom. So that means that it's either forwards or both. What does forwards mean? Forward means when you reach the 100% mark, stop there. Don't go back to the default value. Instead, continue having the animation attach to that element and keep it at the 100% mark. What backwards means is when the page loads or when the animation gets attached to the element, don't wait for the delay to expire. Instead, put it at the 0% keyframe and then wait for the del uh, delay to expire before starting the animation, going to the one, two, three percent um, keyframes, or you know, going through the animation. So, how does this look in reality? Uh, here, I hope this works. So, animation fill mode. The original color of the box that you're going to see is purple. Then, when the animation starts, it's going to go to blue at the zero percent keyframe. It's going to change to green, and then it's going to go to yellow. So when there's no animation attached to it, it's going to be in the left-hand corner, and it's going to be purple. And so here, none and forwards, none of them have the 0% mark. Now they went from 0% to 100%. They went to 100%, and they're going to turn yellow. And forwards says, when you reach the 100% key keyframe, stay there. And both says, do both forwards and backwards. And that's why these two are yellow. But backwards says, don't want at the end end up at the 100% mark. Instead, go back to the original state. And none says, pretend the animation was never there. So let's go through that again. Animation fill mode none, and forwards are both going to be purple. Backwards and both are going to be blue. You see that? And they're already at the left-hand uh, mark of uh, 200 pixels over. When we hit the 0% keyframe, they're all blue, and they're all at the 200 pixel mark. When we hit the 99%, they're almost yellow, and they're almost at the 600 pixel mark. But then when it reaches 100%, the backwards and the none go back to as if the animation was not even applied. So can you stop an animation? In fact, oops, you can. This is called catch the snowflake. So here it says WebKit animation place state. And you have two choices, either paused or running. By default, the value is running, so you don't have to include it. But if you want to, you can do paused. So in this case, on hover, when I hover over the snowflake, it's paused. And that's animation play state. And both the um, fill mode and play state can, can be part of the, um, of the shorthand. So then in addition to that, we actually have a little API or events that happen. So there's um, animation start, animation end, and animation iteration which I think this are supposed to be capital right here, the I, the E, and the S. So that's a typo. Uh, feel free to do a pull request. 
um, but there, you can ha actually add an event listener. And so what I do it with them is I remove the class that has the animation for 100 milliseconds and I put it back on to restart it. Um, and that I did a lot um, throughout this animation. But also what you can do is when the animation ends, you can add a new class and attach a new animation. So if you have like an arm going like this and then like that, you can actually do that whole thing with keyframes and delays. Um, but if you're not sure if the delay is going to be exact, and this is an important key uh, point to animation, and um, the UI is single threaded. And so you have the UI thread that's taking care of um, user interactions and painting and laying out the page and all your JavaScript and your animation. And the animation is the lowest priority on the UI thread. So let's say you start right on page load and you have 10 animations that are each a second apart. So you have a delay of zero seconds, one second, two seconds, three seconds, four seconds, through eight, or whatever, through 10. Um, and it takes six seconds for the page to load. The animation delay of the first six will expire, but nothing will animate. And then the first six will actually start, or seven, or however long it takes, once the page loads. And so for that reason, um, you might want to use the API instead of relying on delay. What I usually do is I add the class that adds the animation once the page is loaded. So that is um, what I want to share with you today. And let me see if I can get out of uh, full screen mode and see if there's any questions. Question earlier, but I think somebody in the comments had answered it. Uh, Anita had asked, okay. uh, is there a complete CSS3 resource that outlines the current prefix requirements? And I think the answer in the chat was uh, caniuse.com was was that. That's, that is what I use. I use can I use. Uh, can I use is um, really, really helpful. If you want more details on the specifics, uh, I used to have a blog post on it, and mine is woefully outdated, so usually um, uh, MDN will have something um, that is will tell you exactly when um, things switched over and what the quirks are. But can I use also has quirks, so I would check out um, can I use first, and if it doesn't answer uh, you, then um, look for blog posts or um, MDN or webplatform.org. Didn't see any um, so other. CS I didn't see any other questions there, but uh, I apologize. Uh, yes. Lori has one. It says CSS3 animations are hardware uh, accelerated, uh, right? And not always. Um, it depends what you're animating. If you're animating top or something that will actually change the layout of the page, it won't take the whole, like, if you have to repaint for every animation, it's not going to be hardware accelerated because the repaint is still in the CPU. So you actually want to stick it onto the GPU. Um, there's a lot of properties that will do it, but it's not necessarily just the animation because if you're actually animating um, part of the box model, you're repainting, and that's not going to stick on the GPU because you know then you'd have to be going back and forth. So um, stick opacity 0.9999. I think opacity one will actually do the trick, um, or stick uh, transform uh, translate z zero on it. Um, don't put that on all your elements, but uh, stick it on your animations to hard work accelerate them. Oh, 3D animations, yeah, they're definitely, um, the, the question was clarified. I meant 3D animations, yes. By definition, 3D animations are always on the uh, GPU. And let me just check a look and see if there's any other questions. And yes, it is a serious foosball game. They take their foosball very seriously. I'm at the, the Survey Monkey offices right now, um, and uh, ping pong. Uh, I won. I won a game one time, and and I kind of suck. Um, and like the guy's still like, everyone's like, you beat him because he was actually one of the really good players. I'm like, he just messed up. I just kept hitting it back. So um, yeah, they're very serious about it here. I didn't know what that was um, referring to, but now that you turned your head and foot, pointed it out, yeah. <laughs> it was falling right back there. That's awesome. Um, yeah, they they have really nice new offices, and. I think we're good on questions. Does anyone else have a question? Okay, so let me just reiterate. I'm not trying to market myself because I don't make any money off of this, but every everything that you've seen here, first of all, this slide deck will always be up on my GitHub, um, which is estelle.github.io, and all the other sub talks that I talked about are also there. So if you want to learn more about the selectors or you remember how I did the forms example 
or if you want to learn more about gradients or more about animations, um, there's a talk on all of those. So you can just uh, take a look through the slide deck. And yeah, some of them are slightly outdated, um, but it's still, you know, everything's relevant. There's just more goodies coming through the pipe.